So, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for excellent presentations. Now we have a little bit of time for questions. And there are two microphones on each side, so please line up. I see there is one person over there. So please state your name, keep the question short, and tell us whom you're asking. So please, Vala. Yes. My name is Kristin Vala Ragnarsdóttir from the University of Brist uh, no, from the University of Iceland, I'm sorry. <laughs> Used to be at the University of Bristol. My, my question is directed to Stefan Ramsdorf, um, but I invite all of you to respond to this. You have shown us um, very good scientific data to show us that we are uh, heading for uh, tipping points that may have huge consequences. Your institute, Stefan, and the Club of Rome, of which I'm a member, have, uh, have uh, set, put together a planetary emergency plan with 20 points to, to, to look at that pertain to, to um, global commons and energy transformation, economic transformation, and societal transformation. Do you think that the Arctic Circle and all nations should declare a planetary emergency and actually focus on that plan and try to come up with solutions to avert a catastrophe? Thank you, Vala. Thanks for that question. As to you know, how much use it is to declare an emergency, it's hard to judge for me as a natural scientist. The key thing is to act, really, whether you call it an emergency or whatever, um, because it, it is an emergency in the sense that we have to act very fast to avoid a major planetary disaster. The IPCC report on 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees that uh, was published last year has a very important table in it which tells us how much CO2 we can still emit if we want to limit global warming to a certain limit. And for example, if you want to stay well below 2 degrees, which has been agreed by all nations in Paris, we have less than 800 gigatons of CO2 that we can still emit. We're emitting more than 40 per year, and so that at the current rate, in 20 years, it would be all over. And emissions are even still increasing. And so we need to very rapidly, within the next few years, turn the tide of rising emissions and go into a rapid decline of global CO2 emissions. Thank you, Stefan. I think we have another question over there. I'm Peter Fikowski with the Foundation for Climate Restoration. And uh, Stefan, uh, your tipping points is very important and of course very interesting. To, to, uh, to what degree have we not passed the fundamental tipping point of getting our planet back into a hothouse? And insofar as there are methods to get carbon out, should we emphasize getting the trillion tons out as rapidly as we can to make sure we stay in an interglacial? Well, you're referring to the uh, risk of crossing a tipping point where further warming becomes inevitable due to positive uh, amplifying feedbacks. That is uh, very much um, debated in the scientific community whether such a tipping point actually exists. Uh, I would say we can't entirely rule it out, but I think it's actually very unlikely. That's my view as a paleoclimatologist because we actually, in Earth history, we have had climate states millions of years back. You, you know, you have to go back actually several million years uh, to find climates that are several degrees warmer than now, you know, like the climate we are heading towards. And these climates also have remained stable. Like you have stable climates that are two degrees warmer, three degrees warmer, four degrees warmer. So I don't think there will be this kind of runaway greenhouse effect personally. Of course, it's uh, not a good idea to have a climate that is two or three degrees warmer because of the consequences for massive sea level rise, changing weather patterns with in extreme events, etc. So I'm not uh, saying it's a good idea, but I don't think there will be this hothouse uh, runaway effect, although it's definitely worth studying like some of the colleagues are doing. Just a word on your uh, final part of the question, taking out carbon dioxide. Uh, I'm, yeah, I, I think we should really try uh, to do that, but I don't see a large potential for that. I think there, there is some potential uh, 
enhancing the capacity of the soils to take up carbon and store carbon, for example. Um, there are some technological solutions that are being investigated, but they all tend to be much more expensive than simply switching to renewable energy. So it's actually much cheaper to not emit the CO2 in the first place, rather than emitting it and then trying to get it back out of the atmosphere. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we have time for one quick question at the end of this. Maria, over there. Actually, I would like him to ask the question if he's quick. Oh, he's left. Because mine is probably not quick. Okay. The thing is that, uh, I, if I understand you right, then we have 20 to 30 years to really cut down almost everything that we can in carbon emissions. Have you realized and can you describe for the policymakers that actually haven't been listening or haven't been acting according to your, your results, have you, can you describe what the world will look like in 30 years if this is not done? And I'm talking about economies that really depend on the climate that we have. We need quick answers. Quick. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Who wants to go quick? No, you. Yeah, so, so I worry most about um, the millions uh, of people losing homes and uh, migrating like the Atlantic Cod does already. So basically we all have an issue with society with uh, replacing people and uh, that is for me the greatest worry that this is starting um, and at an accelerating rate and uh, no one has prepared for that. Uh, just one, one of those things that I think we should look at is our food systems. Uh, it used to be said that, that you know, warming up to two degrees may not be such a big deal. You'll, you'll keep food production the same, something will shift. Farmers are intelligent and so on. The problem is the system is quite unstable. And we're seeing that right now, that small, small disruptions to the system lead to various societal uh, disruptions too. So that's something that we should worry about. And that this will happen long before we get to two or three degrees. So final words. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I worry for my children about them living in a planet with hunger crisis, with major conflict. I worked for eight years as an advisor to the German government and we wrote a report called Climate as a Security Risk, where we described the risk of fragile states uh, turned into failed states after a major extreme event, drought, etc. And you can argue that Syria is an example of that. The mass protests there began after the worst drought in Syrian history and according to sediment data, the worst drought in at least 900 years in the Eastern Mediterranean. And if you already have states with, uh, which are conflicted inside, fragile, etc., this could uh, really flip them over into failed state and then you get mass refugee movements. It's kind of, I don't even like to talk about it, basically. I think the, the risks are really scary. And I think these are final fitting words. Please join me in thanking uh, the speakers and thank you for being a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you.